So I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, thank Kalamazoo, Michigan. All right, Georgia, all along. I appreciate all of you uh, joining to us and uh, thank you so much for your interest in this session. You can continue as I talk to sort of answer your names uh, in the chat. Um, while our general preference is that we are um, in not in webinar format where we can, uh, or, but more in a format where we can see each other. Due to the nature of what we want to deliver today, we want to make sure the engagement part is important to us, but the priority for us today is to make sure that you have the information that is necessary for you to understand the applied leadership process, the application process, and what it is that um, um, you'll need to do. We'll be sharing today at a high level about the application process <clears throat> and allow space for, also allow space for ALN alumni, those who have participated in prior ALN um, classes, to share their experience in the class, um, their current experience in their work and sort of lessons they've gleaned from the work. And today, we'll definitely allow space for questions, Q&A that we plan to answer. There's a, um, a link at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you might be on the side at the bottom, you'll know your particular screen that has Q&A. At any point that you have a question, please drop that question in the Q&A box um, because there are as a 100 or more of you, it is difficult for us to follow questions in chat. So we ask that you put your questions in the Q&A. We will save time at the end of the presentation to respond to your questions. And if there is any question for any reason that we do not get to in this process, we will make sure we email a response to you. So again, thank you so much for dedicating time and space um, to join us today. And by way of proper introduction, my name is Gail D. Mumford. I work at the Annie E. Casey Foundation in the Judicial Justice Strategy Group. One of my many roles is to manage and lead this work, the leadership work of the strategy group. You may wonder, what is this Applied Leadership Network? I'm excited about it. What is it? Well, I will say that this work is a joint venture between our Juvenile Justice Strategy Group and our leadership development unit, all umbrella and under the Annie E. Casey Foundation. So that's where we come. So again, thank you so much for um, participating today. We want to talk a little bit about ALN, hear from the experiences of prior um, alumni, and we also want to spend a significant time talking about the application process. Many of you have launched or begin your applications, but to be considered, you must press that submit button. So um, remember, press submit. As for ALN, some of you may wonder, some of you may already know, what is ALN? Again, I said ALN is a joint venture between the foundation's um, <clears throat> leadership development unit and juvenile justice strategy group. If we know um, from the current climate that we live in, that it takes strong, dynamic leaders to really change the culture of an organization and, and move and guide systems to achieve better results. We are in a space where leadership now more than ever is needed. And I believe it is my firm belief, and I think I'm joined in that belief that the results count principles um, can help leaders uh, move forward, change that's necessary in the now. Um, this process allows for selected participants, and I say selected because it is a highly competitive process to apply, um, to learn the results count uh, principles and apply the tools, tools and strategies in all the work that you do while balancing the daily demands of your role. Moving a measurable and equitable results is one aim of the process, particularly moving those results for Black and Latino young men. Results count considers all positions and vantage points. So don't assume that because you're not the director or administrator, that you're not right for this process. Um, the tools that your results count teaches can be applied at any level, regardless of your role or your position in the system. I'm gonna share a little bit about prior classes. Prior classes, there are four classes that we've launched, I think since 2008 was the first class, the eighth and I nine. And they were organized and uh, they applied in the uh, 
as uh, in place leader and emerging leader. Um, and that worked very well and effectively for us for a great number of years. In this iteration of the results count um, a process that we're using for the Applied Leadership Network, we are, have expanded how we consider participation. We've learned a great many lessons about what it takes to sustain change and support liberty, connection, and opportunity for young people. Now we're inviting community to apply, folks who represent and sit in spaces and community, and the voices from those who are most impacted by the system to join in this uh, process um, as a part of participation, as a part of submitting an application, as a team, not entering as an individ individual, because it takes a team to move a huge result. Um, we're as teams, we will be invited to identify a meaningful change that you desire to make within your community that impacts your juvenile justice system or change that you wanna make in your juvenile justice system. Over the course of participations, you're gonna, participants will devise and implement and refine and monitor action plans to ensure those actions that are identified as needed for change are actually changed and results are achieved. Teams, as you consider applying, consider the conditions in your community and your jurisdiction and submit your applications based on the specific aspect or work where change is needed. While we in this class have a particular interest or focus on building com a community-based continuums of prevention um, and diversion into po positive supports, we are open to be wowed by other opportunities to use the results count tools. So while that is our interest, you are not limited or penalized for not uh, providing an application with that focus. Um, your interest is appreciated. We are very excited, very excited and ready to select teams. It is a highly competitive process. Um, we recognize it will take some time for many of you um, to participate. It may seem you'll be away from your work and the work has to be maintained, maintained, but we have strategies that will help you along that way. Again, many of you have started applications in the Survey Monkey Apply. Um, and I wanna share to be considered, you must submit the application to the foundation. If you're having any difficulties with completing the application or hitting any firewalls, or any links do not work, please contact my colleague, Dante Green, who is gonna follow me now to talk a little bit more about what it means to get prepared for this process. Thank you again for joining and we hope that we provide helpful information to help you consider your next step in applying to be a part of the fifth class of the Applied Leadership Network. Dante? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, can, can you go to the next slide for me, please? Next slide, sorry, yes. All right, so thank you, Gail D, and hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Dante Green, and I am the Program Associate uh, for the NE Casey's Juvenile Justice Strategy Group. And I will also serve as the primary point of contact uh, for Class 5 applicants. So I'm gonna briefly cover uh, the checklist before applying, the two sets of questions in the application, the selection, the, the selection process timeline, and uh, seminar dates. So let's jump right in. All right, so before applying, uh, before starting the application process, teams should identify all team members and select a, point, a team point of contact. The team point of contact will serve as the communication liaison between the team and the foundation. So after all team members are identified and a team point of contact is selected, Team members should create a Survey Monkey Apply account and begin the application process. Uh, next slide for me, please. So there are two sets of questions in the application. Uh, the first set of questions as displayed here are team level questions and should be answered by the entire team as one unit. Uh, the second set of questions, next slide for me. The second set of questions must be completed by each individual on the team. Uh, the individual level questions touch on individual contributions to the team and individual desired learning outcomes. 
So how do you invite team members to complete their question? Uh, next slide for me, please. So after your team completes the team level questions, you will advance to section two of the application. As displayed on the left-hand side, the, the, this section is titled, um, Invite Team Members to Complete Questionnaire. And in this section, there's a big green icon that reads, request a recommendation as circled on this presentation. Uh, this, this is the icon you will use to invite team members to complete the questionnaire. And the second paragraph, which is highlighted, uh, provides a brief explanation of why the green icon reads, request a recommendation. So to invite your team members to the application, all you need is their first and last name and their email address. The invites will populate under the recommendations section at the bottom of the web page. So again, remember, when you see green, it is time to invite your team. Next slide for me, please. Thank you. Um, so applications went live on June 1st, and they're due to the foundation by July 10th at 5 p.m. Eastern time. So if you have any questions, concerns, thoughts, please, please share them with me well before the due date. Um, there are two stages of the selection process. The first is a review of the submitted applications, and the second will be virtual interviews. Once applications are received, by our internal team, we'll, we will begin reviewing them and begin making decisions. By July 26, selected teams will receive an invite to the virtual interview. The, not, the notification teams receive will include a Calendly invite that allows teams to select interview time slots. All team members should be present during the, during the virtual interview. And interviews are set to begin on August 9th and will conclude on August 23rd. And class five teams will be announced by September 6th. Next slide for me, please. Thank you. Uh, so there will be six two and a half day seminars. So that's six and two, there will be six two and a half day seminars. Uh, seminar one is the only seminar held in 2023. The other five seminars will be held in 2024. And over the summer of 2024, faculty will schedule site visits to visit individual team sites. All six seminars will be held in person and attendance is mandatory of all team members unless otherwise, unless you notify us in advance. And travel related expenses, including food and lodging are covered by the program. And so now you will hear from three of our ALN alumni. So Barbara, over to you. Uh, thank you, Dante. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Barbara Squires. I'm the Director of Leadership Development here at the Casey Foundation. And as Gail mentioned, um, Leadership Development is partnering with the Juvenile Justice Strategy Group in um, the design and support of this program. So we're, we're quite excited to be um, near the launch of class five. Um, and we thought that all of you who are potentially interested in being a part of the program might benefit and maybe have some curiosity about hearing from some former participants in the program. So with that, we move to the next slide. I'd like to introduce um, three of our ALN alum who are with us today. So TJ, if you want to wave your hand or something, there you go. Um, TJ is the Juvenile Court Administrator um, in Pierce County in Washington State. Marsha um, is the Executive Director with the Missouri Juvenile Justice Association. And McQuell Lewis is the Acting Director with Juvenile Probation and Court Services in Cook County, um, Illinois. So we're super happy that all three of them could be here with us. So I'm gonna ask them a few questions and then just remember um, you may have some questions of your own that you wanna pose to them during the um, Q&A session as well. So let's get started. And I wanna begin with um, McQuell actually um, and invite you to reflect back on your experience in ALN and think about two things. One is, what was the greatest impact that participating in the ALN 
um, had on you personally, and then on the work that you do in Cook County. Well, Barbara, thank you for the opportunity to share uh, my reflections. Uh, relevant to the question, there were a couple of things that resonated for me right away. Um, the first, I'm passionate about professional development. And so the opportunity to receive professional development uh, that will prepare me for leadership was um, a great opportunity for me. I was really uh, new in leadership in my jurisdiction at that moment. And I was invited to uh, be a teammate to, uh, at that time, the uh, veteran leader um, on my team. And so it, it gave me some exposure to frameworks. And for me, the uh, platform for frameworks, putting things into context was really helpful for me to understand how to move the work forward. Uh, and I was able to apply uh, the things that I was learning really uh, right away. Perfect, thank you. Um, Marsha, I'm gonna ask you the same question. So thinking both about um, what you took away and what you think the impact was on your leadership and on the work that you do. Sure, um, thank you again for inviting me and welcome um, all of you potential ALN ALNers. Um, so for me, I had very, um, I had very similar situation to what Miguel just described. I was the emerging leader on my team. I had just recently been appointed our local JDI coordinator. We had not been involved in JDI very long. So I was just, I was as green as the grass and at that time. And so um, for me, I did not have much formal leadership training. So all of it was very beneficial. Um, I particularly um, feel like I ha have the, got the most benefit, I guess, from learning about um, results-based facilitation. That was, you know, something I, I attended meetings all the time with no real purpose. We talk about great things. We would leave. We no one had any action, actionable items. We'd come back in a month, and we were talking about the same things. So the results-based facilitation was. Uh, a competency that I learned through results count that has really been beneficial in my work. Um, you know, really, um, when, when you learn that skill, you learn to um, design a meeting, facilitate a meeting with a result in mind, where you want to to um, get to the results you want to get to, and so that's been helpful. Um, and even as a participant, I can we can use the that results based facilitation skill to. If you're in one of those meetings that are just kind of talk, 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 and we don't have anything actionable, you can use that skill to, you know, bring about, so what are our next steps? Who's responsible for what? And bring the group to that. And then personally, for me, I'm a, I am a introvert through and through. And um, ALN really helped me um, get past some of those fears or concerns, you know, just like participating in a webinar like this, it's not easy for me as an introvert, but ANL, ANL pushed me to do better, to get through some of those skills um, with some of the, the competencies that we were taught. So for me, that's what ALN did. Thank you, thank you. And just um, for the folks on the call, you may have just heard a reference to results count. So that is the name, actually the trademark name that is given to um, Casey's brand of leadership development that is really about supporting leaders um, in their efforts to achieve equitable results for the kids and families and communities on whose behalf they work. So that, that's what the results count reference was. Um, so um, we really do hope that um, participating in ALN has a um, impact on one's leadership, but I think the real proof of the pudding is, does it help then to um, lead to and support practice changes or policy changes or um, other kinds of um, activity within your systems and communities that ultimately benefit kids and families and communities? So TJ, I'm gonna ask you, that question as a result of having gone through ALN 
Um, can you speak to any systems or practice changes that um, came about in Pierce County um, that you could tie back to having been through um, the Applied Leadership Network? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I agree with my colleagues who've already kind of started the conversation around, you know, we, we had really, really good, incredible facilitators um, as ALN, and that was super helpful. Um, it in increased my individual confidence, but then also gave me some tools and strategies to move the work forward uh, in our local jurisdiction, because sometimes it just seemed like it, it was really hard to move things forward. There was just a lot of talk and talk and talk. Uh, so yeah, we were, we've were we been a JDI site since 2003. We had a really strong, aggressive reduction ag agenda around reducing our disparities. And the work just kind of seemed to get kind of stagnant at times. And we realized like, we really need to do a better job with engaging families. Um, we need to create more space for community partnerships to be involved, divert more young people out of our system and, and build our community capacity to support young people. So the, the ALN really provided us with some tools and strategies to engage families in a different way, engage our community and bring them to the table to make a powerful contribution. And then also to engage our staff in a different way to be more involved. And there's a place at the table for everybody and not just formal leaders, but everybody having a voice in where we're, we're going. Uh, so that led to us becoming a probation transformation and a deep insight which then we, you know, some of the things that came from that is improving our community partnerships to about 20 partners that are now supporting young people who are diverted out of our system. We're close to almost 80% of our uh, referrals being diverted out to our community partners. Um, we implemented a uh, incentive-based um, probation model, which is called opportunity-based probation, which is in line with adolescent brain development. And again, that was getting the court, community, families, young people all on the same page uh, through some of the tools and frameworks that we learned. So those are just a few I would share. Thank you. Marsha, what about you in Missouri? What, what, what came about from your participation in ALN? Yeah, so at, shortly after I um, started the a ALN seminar, I transitioned into my new role here as exec, executive director of MJJ. And in that work, I do a lot um, at the state level policy, um, particularly with our legislature. And so for me, the, the some of the skills and you know the um, competencies that I took back from um, being part of the ALN class um, helped me um, with, we we basically raised the age of juvenile court jurisdiction. I know for a lot of you on this webinar, that's probably already happened, but Missouri was one of the few holdout states. And so it's been had been going on for a long time. And so using some data and, and leveraging that, we were able to, you know, convince our legislators to raise the age of juvenile court jurisdiction while also providing adequate resources to do that. Um, also part of, um, uh, a state level policy change that um, I was involved in was um, the incorporation of juvenile officer performance standards. That was kind of in the works um, just um, as I was beginning ALN and we were able to incorporate um, the core strategies of JDAI within the juvenile officer performance standards. So now we address um, the responsibility of the juvenile officers in courts to use um, response grids, you know, don't use solitary confinement, um, making sure youth aren't being placed in detention for technical violations. So there's many of the core um, principles of JDAI are embedded in the juvenile officer performance standards as a result of that. And then most recently we were successful in, um, again, using data to leverage a result um, in our um, our state's uh, certification process. Um, finally, we have a minimum age of certification, um, and then we also increase that minimum age. So uh, a few successes on a state level, um, a little bit different than than what TJ's experienced, but it also shows you that we can we can utilize this format and these skills in many different aspects. Thank you. 
Um, so I think we may have made reference um, uh, to the fact that we've actually we're actually changing the model of um, the Applied Leadership Network for this upcoming cohort. Um, in the earlier classes, the, the four that we had, um, the um, participants were all system leaders, either emerging leaders or seasoned leaders who came together in pairs. And as Gail mentioned, there was a lot of benefit that we think came from that. But um, over the time in planning for this cohort, the thinking has been that we um, that there would be even greater benefit by expanding um, the size of the teams and the um, participants who are in the teams. So, Miquel, I'm going to ask you this question: um, Given that we're changing the model from um, to include both system and community leaders, what advantage do you see to to our making this change? Applied Leadership Network uh, really uh, taught us about accelerating results, right? That's really the mantra of the Applied Leadership Network to accelerate results in our jurisdiction. And my teammate and I receiving those tools, receiving all of the development that was offered to us, we were excited. We were really energized while my, my teammate was the in place leader at that time. Um, anyone who knows my my colleague and teammate knows that she has lots of energy to give as well as I did. And so we brought what we had received from the Applied Leadership Network seminars and right away began to um, implement them in our respective roles and in our convenings of stakeholders. But one of the things that we would both reflect on was if we had others and on our team from this jurisdiction, we'd be able to move this process forward a lot faster. And I think that's the, really the value add to this uh, new model of having a larger team from uh, jurisdictions is that folks from different disciplines, community providers, systems folks will receive these tools and be able to um, frame their project for their jurisdiction together. And that gives them an opportunity to apply the lessons and move the work in an accelerated way because they'll be convened as a team in the seminar. So um, great job, uh, Casey, Juvenile Justice Strategy Group and Barbara and the professional development team on thinking about how to actually accelerate results in sites even further by bringing more folks along for the journey. Thanks, Lance McQuell. TJ, would you, what would you add to that? Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, that was one of the challenges, honestly, that we had was we would, uh, myself and another leader would go there and we'd get all this great information and we're just like, just so excited. And we'd come back and people would be like, oh, geez, no, 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 just easy. And so it was really, um, you know, it became a bit of a challenge to like, okay, no, hey, here's all the information. How are we gonna go forward? So I think having more people at the table more voices, uh, more perspectives, not just court folks. Um, you can come up with a good cadence that everybody can kind of carry and be accountable for certain sections and it could roll out a little bit more smoothly. Um, you know, it's just a lot of information. It's really good information, but it is a lot. And so having more people on board to really help kind of understand it at, so you can move forward at the right pace. Pace is important in, the, in this work. Thank you. Um, so I have a question for all of you, because um, you all at one point were in the shoes of the folks who are on this webinar of contemplating participating. Um, and, um, and now, of course, you, you were selected and you went through the process um, and you're on the other side of it. So what advice would you give to um, colleagues who are considering this opportunity? And um, Marsha, why don't we start with you? So um, I was trying to um, decide what would be the best piece of advice for all of you. Um, so I think the first one is um, jump on the opportunity. If, if you can, um, you won't regret it. Um, it's a, a will be a valuable experience that will pay you back years and years and years to come. Um, but with that said, consider your commitment. It is a, it is it is a lot of work. Um, you have to come prepared to participate. Um, there's homework assignments, um, things that you need to do to prepare for class. 
and um, you need to make sure that you have the time in your schedule um, that will allow you to do so. Um, so that would be, I don't, I don't want to, there's more that I can say, but I want to allow my colleagues to have an opportunity because I'm sure our advice is all going to be very similar. So I'll, I'll turn that back to either TJ or Miguel. Uh, TJ, why don't you go and we'll let Miguel close this out. Yeah, I mean, I, I think if you are a person who recognizes that systems are not working well um, for all youth, <clears throat> and you recognize that changes need to be made, then I strongly encourage you to uh, to take advantage of it. We need more courageous leaders in this world. Um, this this uh, this class will give you the tools and strategies and frameworks to help you. And at the same time, if you're an individual who likes to grow uh, individually as a person, and, and you know, Miquel talked about it. If you if you like professional development, if you want to improve your own skill set, then this is the place for you. Uh, this will definitely challenge you. It'll push you out of your comfort zone. It'll make you a better person and a, a stronger leader, a more effective leader. So that really spoke to me. Um, I, I really appreciated. I still maintain contact with my colleagues who were uh, across the country who were in my class. So I appreciate having a network uh, that I can reach out to when times are tough or I'm struggling with something. Um, so if you, you appreciate like different perspectives from across the country, other jurisdictions, um, those are all some of the reasons that I think like if those things are feel appetizing to you, then I, I say, you know, you really should jump in uh, and and uh, apply. And well, what would we add? Couple things participate with an open mind. Um, be, be prepared lessons that uh, will resonate right away, and some that's going to challenge your thinking. And if you're a, person, a, a leader who appreciates a good challenge, which I imagine if you're in this work, you are a leader that appreciates a good challenge because this is challenging work, then be prepared to be challenged and ex accept the opportunity to be challenged because it's the challenges that help us grow. Right, we we grow when we are challenged, not necessarily when we're comfortable. And so, opportunity to be challenged, uh, step into your leadership. We are in this work to lead, to transform our systems so that we can serve children and families and our communities in better and improved ways. And so, the Apply Leadership Network uh, is a network of practitioners that continue to support each other. I echo TJ sentiment that. I have um, long lasting relationships with my classmates and now with the folks who participated in other classes. And that's invaluable to be able to bounce an idea off of another leader in a different jurisdiction who might have a different perspective, but have, having had faced the same challenge, it has added value to my leadership journey and um, really appreciative of that. So yeah, step into your leadership, accept the challenge and be prepared to transform your jurisdiction. Thank you. Um, thanks to all three of you. I, and I think the one thing I might add in addition to all of that is um, the benefit to the Casey Foundation to be in partnership with um, all the leaders who've been part of this program. I think um, you know we talk about the lifelong relationships that you've built with one and another. I think um, Casey has also really benefited from the relationships we've built from with the participants in the program. So thanks to all of you. And with that, I'm going to hand it back to Dante, who's going to help facilitate the questions. Thank you, Barbara. And uh, thank you, TJ, McQuell, and uh, Marsha for joining us today and providing a little insight. Really helpful. Uh, so I'd just like to start by saying thank you for joining us today to all of the participants. And uh, we are now going to move into the final segment of the webinar agenda, which is the Q&A. Uh, so please share your questions using the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen, and then I will read them aloud uh, to our team. And as a side note, we only have about 20 minutes or so for the Q&A segment. So if you are still holding any questions, thoughts, concerns um, at the conclusion of today's informational webinar, please share them with me. And you can contact me via email at dgreen at aecf.org. Uh, Dianisa just put it in the chat. Thank you. 
Uh, so let's jump right in. Um, so a common question, and I actually just saw, let me pull the Q&A up, is, is this a paid opportunity? Um, I guess I could take that question. Um, and um, in most of the prior classes, um, the participants, uh, alumni and class members, had the uh, authorization of their organization to um, be used this as work time, right? And so while they were physically away from the office, they were still paid in roll because of the contribution of the work to the organization. So that is in time past. I suspect that that will continue now. If there are participants that are on a primary payroll and they have the approval to participate, then we would um, hope and expect that that organization uh, will continue to play their um, employees just because of the value of allow them to use time because of the value of this work. If there are, um, partners that are invited to engage in the work and it comes at hardship and expense, uh, we would like to consider a conversation in case by case basis uh, for that. But we much like the foundation's fellowship class, the children and um, family and children fellowship is not a paid fellowship. And, and however, um, given the nature of how we invited folks to compose their teams, we know that we need to think differently and carefully about um, um, folks' time and um, and how we, um, um, if necessary, provide stipend or compensation. Um, that is not a given. It is something that we're willing to talk about and talk through. Thank you, Gail. So the next question, the application specifies that programs that serve Black and Latino men are preferred. So does this mean that programs that serve Black girls and Latinas won't be considered? I do not want to hog all the answering time. I really don't. Uh, and I really won't. Uh, a couple of things. Uh, we know the impact of the systems of justice to Black and Brown and Indigenous young people, right? And we want to focus our energy on attention to those young people. Um, and all children, and particularly those children. Um, so girls, boys, all the above um, um, are, are part of our consideration when you um, submit your application. So it is, uh, the specificity is, is something that we're interested in. We also know that some people come from very, very rural areas where the, the, the population of, of, of the kids that we're particularly focusing isn't um, maybe their, their, their leading driver um, to kids getting in touch with the system, coming in touch with the system of the law, but they have other deep issues that it would be good to resolve because other rural communities could learn from that. So again, wow us, um, and yes, we're welcome, we're open to boys, girls, and in between. And at the expense of being long, I want to um, go back to a place that I omitted and dropped in the chat. Eligibility, five, four to 16 members, and at least one of which uh, should be a juvenile justice agency person. Um, we want to advance the well-being of young people and uh, those at most risk of involvement in the juvenile justice system. Um, you are not required to have been a participant of the Juvenile Detention Alternatives Initiative, the Foundation for Patient Transformation Work, or any other site work we've done, we have done uh, or launched for participation. We recommend the composition of the team to be two or more people who have already worked together. Uh, we are, it'd be exciting to meet new people and say, let's be a team and move something, but we prefer that work be done. We want action-oriented, bold folks. Um, who will use their leadership to make a difference. We intend to select five different teams, jurisdiction, um, and our max participant number is 20. Um, we are not close to a, a, a complete community team or community partners. And if there's an impact to be made inside of a system, we have to have some type content in the system some way. 
So before it was primarily driven by system, and we're moving away from that, I would say this. We have some, some proclivities and interests. Submit your application. If we have questions, we'll follow up and we'll try to provide some clarity. That is my briefest answer, and I'm going to hand off to some of my other colleagues to share in the responses. So um, I'll jump to the next question. Do you assist with finding financial resources for our, for our organizations? Okay, I'll try this one, but I'm not entirely sure I understand the question. Um, so the role of this program is really around building up the leadership development of the participants and to work with the teams to accomplish a result or tackle a challenge that is um, um, alive for them in, in their community or in their system or in their state. And so to that end, it does not come with financial resources for those organizations, but I think within what you'll find is that within the overall cohort, you'll be learning from one another about potential resources that are out there. Um, but um, I think we ought to be real clear that this, by applying to the program and getting accepted, this is not um, a um, um, intended to be entree into receiving a grant from the Casey Foundation. So I, I think we want to make that very clear to folks. Thank you, Barbara. Okay, so so one of the so one of the members of the team has to be a JJA employee, a juvenile justice agency employee. And I think Gail just briefly touched on this um, when she talked about the team eligibility uh, requirements. And um, teams should be comprised of a system, a juvenile justice agency leader with some level of formal authority, and then also include community leaders in youth representation, if possible. Uh, so that that's like the short answer for that question. Did I miss anything? All right. So is there is there a way we could read more about the alums projects? Um, there are some blog posts that have been posted on um, uh, Casey's website over the years. Um, uh, I don't know how easy it is to find all of those, but we have tried over the, um, the life of the program to highlight the work of um, ALNers. Um, and so a lot of that may be found on um, the Casey website, but if you have specific questions, I think if you reach out to Dante, we can maybe help put you in touch with some ALNers who can talk about the work that they moved along through through participation in the program. I believe a link to some of their work was in some of the announcement for the class. Okay. Absolutely. So are participants grouped by area or is the cohort mixed with different states? Um, our, our hope is to have a mixed group um, within the um, in within this cohort. So we're um, as, as Gail mentioned, we're looking to um, select four to six teams. And so um, having representation geographically, diversity in the kind of program uh, projects or uh, problems that they're trying to tackle, diversity in the composition of those teams, those are all things that we'll be taking into consideration. But um, like this is not all focused on having six teams from the state of Texas, for example. So we are looking for a geographic diversity as well. Thank you. Uh, this question um, maybe can be answered by one of our ALN alumni. Uh, so it says, you, you said you have ideas of how to balance our work with this commitment. What is the time commitment required? I'll start and maybe um, I, I don't know that that I don't know that one of us said that Dante I, I think maybe Gail mentioned something about that there, there could be some so she had some thoughts and Gail if I'm putting you on the spot I apologize um, I could speak to the 
time commitment. Um, I think um, when you um, are preparing, if I remember correctly, we came out to Baltimore about every couple of months or so, give or take eight weeks or so. Um, and we generally had um, assignments, reading assignments, um, preparation work. Um, I will tell you it, I, I don't believe now, again, remember I'm an introvert. So I think about things, I reflect, I take several days and I think about them some more. But for me, it, it wasn't something that I could just plan to get on the airplane and on my flight there, I would just read up and be ready to go. Um, there, were, there, were, there was a little bit more, um, you know, in, uh, commitment than that, I would say, you know, there were, and, and then you're also working, you were working on your project with your partner, with your team, your partner. Um, so I, several hours um, uh, in between uh, seminars. And then again, when you leave each seminar, you're going to have some responsibilities, um, but you're also, you're after you've learned some skills you're, you're continuously you're, you're coming to seminars but you're also working on your project so you're you're committing to both um, you can't just work on your project every couple months when you show up at your ALN seminar so I don't know if TJ you or Miguel have more to add to that or Yeah, I mean, I think for me, it was a bit of a, a lift, uh, but also it totally aligned with the work that I was doing. So it felt um, like it enhanced what I was doing and not taken away from. So I was I was eager to read all the material and practice and, um, you know, trying to do different things in the jurisdiction to move the work forward because I recognize the need for change is strong. Um, so I was actually looking forward to the strategies. I was looking forward to each workshop. I think we had four, uh, maybe five, uh, where we had to travel. But other than that, all of the materials and the reading and the, um, the stuff I found super helpful. I'm sitting in uh, finding it difficult to quantify the time commitment aside from what um, has been acknowledged as the time commitment for each seminar. But as Marcia just pointed out, to think about the commitment in these sort of buckets, right? There's a preparation for the seminar, and there will be some readings and work between seminars for uh, delivery at each scheduled seminar. And there is the work site relative to your team plan. Now, class five will have a composition of four to six team members. And so it's gonna be important that the team develops a cadence for, for meetings so that they are connected and moving uh, in sync with one another to uh, see the results on their team plan. So, you know, a purpose-based meeting as we heard from Marsha might be an hour, might be two hours, but that'll be something that the team determines. But it's gonna be important to, to develop that cadence and also to give some time to your individual development, your individual consumption and digestion of the material and the lessons, the tools and techniques that'll be shared with you so that you can apply them um, as it aligns with your style, your method of applying um, applying information into in your work. So I'm sorry, I can't say it's gonna be a commitment of two hours or 10 hours, but I think it is important to think about it in terms of the buckets of commitments of your time. Dante, I wanted to add one thing, uh, maybe it underscores something TJ said, um, that the work that we're asking the teams to bring into this program is your real work. It's not like a made up project. It's not an academic thing. It is the real work that you as a, a group of committed individuals are trying to advance back in your home community. Um, to improve outcomes for, for children and youth. And so I think a way to think about it is coming together for the seminars is really providing dedicated time for the teams to get that real work moving. Um, and it's an opportunity that I don't think um, folks often get back home because you're so taken up with the day-to-day -day, uh, of the work that you're trying to do. 
So that may be another way to think about what, um, what you get from participating in the program is real dedicated time as a group to move forward on something that is meaningful to you and not just like, so calling this a project, it really is intended to be real work that um, the applicants um, are, are wanting to focus on. Thank you, Barbara. So can teams be comprised from people from different organizations within a community? And is there an option to network and build a team from attendees? So um, I think, read the question again one more time. I want to, I got yeah. the last answer. What's the first part of that? No worries. So uh, can teams be comprised from people from different organizations within a community? And is there an option to network and build a team from attendees? Um, so in even in the prior classes of ALN, most of some of them are towards the end, I wouldn't say most, but a great number of them were not working in the same organization. Um, but they were working to move a particular result within a space. Um, there was someone from New Mexico that was in the community, youth forum for young people, and then someone inside the system. So there is can be some different kinds of pairings. Um, um, the, the point is to figure out what result you want to move. That is the point. Now, if you're going to be shopping around and speed dating to put a get, you know, do a pickup team here, I don't know how that will work for you. I don't, I don't know how that will work for you. Uh, that, that will be interesting, so. And I think the last part of the answer, Dante, to the second part of the question is that, no, the teams don't form after they're selected. The teams have to be formed um, because, in part, selection is based on understanding who the team members are. Um, yeah. OK, so we have about five more minutes. Um, probably can squeeze in about two, maybe two, two more questions. Uh, where do the in-person sessions take place? And I can cover this. Um, majority of the seminars will take place in Baltimore, Maryland, um, with two seminars, seminar three and seminar five. Um, there will be an alternative location. Now, we have, we're still working those things out in uh, the logistics, but um, majority of the sessions will take place in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, Okay, so have any past team members included justice impacted youth? Is their criteria related to age for team members? Um, um, no, not directly that we're aware of or confessed in the process. Um, I think that answer is correct. And um, we are open to however you choose to compose your team. Uh, if young people uh, can find space and opportunity to participate, let's find space and opportunity to participate. The one thing too um, that we didn't share a bit much about, but there is a team that comes to Baltimore like or come to wherever the seminar. And we encourage folks to have a back home team, like whether it's a formal collaborative you have or and not recreate the wheel on these things, but someone back home where you share this knowledge and information with, where the young person might be involved, um, might be, but may not be able to fly and travel because of some restriction or might got to go to school, something like that, right? But if they're part of the integrated back home team, we just have to, this world does not allow us anymore to be boxy and, and, and constrain our ideas in the way there is so much we learned over the last three years just about how to move forward reform. We would prefer a team where all four of them or six of them were in person with us all the time and participation is part of it. And we we hope that you have a back home team um, where you share and bounce ideas, share learning, share the book, share what you read and practice uh, with not only them, with them. So. I don't say I'm trying to answer some of these questions that I can take real fast. I'm sending a response. Um, no worries. I see you guys working in the, the Q&A chat. Um, so let's just get one more in really quick. So how often are academies held uh, if someone doesn't get into this 
this next group. So when will the maybe potentially a next cohort or class be held? Um, well, when um, for our first four cohorts of the ALN, there was probably under a year, maybe nine months or so that um, um, where we took time off to debrief the prior experience and then um, plan for the next cohort. So may have been about a year between cohorts. There, it's been a much longer time period between cohort four and cohort five. Um, and we're looking to learn a lot from doing it um, under the new model and assuming it all goes well and it doesn't need um, considerable revision. My guess is that the next cohort would be launched you know, somewhere around a year um, after this one. But again, um, we're not on a specific timetable to roll out classes. All right, thank you, Barbara. And thank you for all of those who participated in the Q&A. Um, so that's the conclusion of the Q&A. I've already received several emails um, from participants uh, with questions that I'll make sure I get back to you guys within the next 24 hours. And um, I don't want to dismiss us. Can I can I hand it off to Gail to close us out? And well, thank you, Dante, and thanks to all of you for um, joining us to share as we talk about what this. I, I think it's an amazing process. Um, wonderful thing has come as a result of these ALN alumni that you're looking at. Uh, I am not suggesting that participating in the process graduates you to higher levels of leadership, but almost everyone who has participated is no longer in the current position for which they entered. They do seek higher levels of authority and responsibility and um, lead with grace and dignity and uh, uh, just amazing people that in participating in class, you get to know and connect with them. So you'll be a part of a full network. I have a particular interest in learning and leading. And I know, and I'm sure you know why leadership matters. And the foundation is making this investment in leaders um, because we want to change the trajectory of these young people. We want them to have opportunity. We want them to be well in their homes and in their communities. If in the rare case when we need institutions or when institutional placement or out of their home is necessary, we want those places to be safe. And first and foremost, we want consideration for how do we prevent young people from ever, ever, ever entering these systems and divert them if perchance and it's as appropriate as we can and stretch ourselves on some of these decisions that we don't just do the easy case. I believe Participating in ALN will help those process. I thank you so much for joining us today and may you have a merry, merry, merry day. Thank you so much.